Your passcode has been confirmed. If you need technical assistance during your call, press star zero. After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound sign. I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound sign. I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound sign. This conference is in silent mode. There are 48 parties in conference, including you. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I want to start by thanking everyone for taking time out of your crazy busy days um, to attend this webinar today. And I'd like to thank the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention for this great opportunity to talk about a topic that um, is historically filled with negative emotion. Um, for patients, the experience in the emergency department is often very frustrating. And from the provider side as well, it is also very frustrating and it's a challenging population to provide care for. So the perspective that I hope to bring today to this really challenging issue is that of an emergency department nurse for over 25 years with um, a health services research background. So with that, I'd like to move forward to the next slide. So in the next hour, what I hope to talk about is to take that perspective and begin by framing the situation in emergency departments today and what we face around the country. And actually, it's not even just a United States problem, it's an international problem that can affect the care of patients with sickle cell disease. I'm coming to this presentation today assuming that most of you on the other end of this webinar are probably sickle cell experts, hematology experts, and I hope that there's a few emergency nursing and medicine colleagues out there and commend you for attending if they're there. Um, and then I'm going to give a little bit about barriers as to why it's difficult to provide best practice in this setting and how challenging the situation really is. And then I want to really flip and spend most of the time today talking about the ED scans. And this is a tool, the Emergency Department Sickle Cell Assessment of Needs and Strengths, which is actually a quality improvement framework and a decision support tool that I developed through funded research to help really organize an approach to this really complex, challenging problem. And then I want to present a little bit about how it was developed to give you an idea of the rigor so that when you go back to your emergency departments or if you are the emergency department, to be able to frame it as to this is actually what this tool is, this is how it was developed. But I'd like to spend the most of the time today actually talking about the decisions and the decision support elements within the ED scans as well as as well as talking about some future research that we have funded evaluating the ED scans and some hopeful plans for further dissemination. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge the funding sources to start out with where the K20 was um, the decision support tool itself, the ED scans, was developed with funds by the NIH and then we're currently funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to actually measure some out outcomes for four of the decisions in two different emergency departments here in North Carolina. And then, of course, my multidisciplinary mentoring team from around the country, and then the expert panel also from around the country that evaluated the initial tool. And um, based on their um, uh, comments, it was revised again. And these are the more of the sickle cell experts around the country, sickle cell and pain experts. <clears throat> I want to start with a case study. And this is a typical picture that I can tell you a lot of emergency department physicians and nurses have when they think of a sickle cell patient, with the exception of probably being 50 years old. They probably think more 20, 30, maybe 40. This is a real case um, from about a year and a half ago now. 50-year-old African-American female with SS disease came in with a chief complaint of crisis and shortness of breath for one week. She had just signed herself out of a local hospital immediately before arriving in this emergency department. 
She said she had been getting very, very poor care and her symptoms had not improved while she was there. She had pain in her back and arms, previously received most of her care at the hospital that she was at today, but she was admitted at the other hospital when she went to their outpatient clinic. When you look at her health services utilization, she had multiple hospitalizations and ED visits in the prior year. And when you look at that subjectively, maybe go back one more. I was a little too fast on that slide. Thank you. When you look at this only subjectively and only with health services use, the picture is pretty, is, can be perceived as kind of being negative. Here is a lady who just signed herself out. She's been in the hospital for a week. She wasn't happy with her care. She comes into RED now. We have probably 40 patients waiting in the emergency department. What are we going to do for her today? And that can be um, a stigmatization. It can be a stereotype. It's pretty negative. It could be what people are thinking if they focus only on the subjective information and the health services utilization. Next slide. And so as sickle cell experts, hematologists, and emergency providers who are on this webinar today, we have to take a perspective to look at it bigger than the subjective history and the health services utilization. I like to really stress the past medical history. When you look at this lady, she's really, really sick. Her cocaine abuse is not going to help her, her story here and her attitudes among the providers. But you have to look at it objectively. She's in moderate respiratory distress, really tachypnic, very marked edema to her face, and not taking prednisone. And so when you look at her vital signs, it's pretty clear that she is a really, really sick lady. And even though she just checked out of that hospital for a week, she is really sick right now. So we're going to come back to this case later. Next slide. Everybody on this call is very familiar with the epidemiology of sickle cell, about a 70 to 100,000 um, Americans in the U.S., primarily African-American in the U.S., but not exclusively. can go to the next slide. What I like to highlight with ED physicians and nurses as well is this slide. And this slide represents the life expectancy in the U.S. population using CDC data for the first two sets of bars compared with sickle cell patients, the last two sets of bars. And I think as ED providers, we do tend to focus on pain. We tend to focus on high utilization. We need to focus on life expectancy. And if we're asked as to, well, why should the sickle cell patient come back first, a very good answer is life expectancy. We don't really know for sure that it is only a pain episode at triage, and we really don't have the enough time there to get a good enough history to really be able to determine that. So you can see clearly from these from this data that you know women live a little older a little longer than than um, men do, whites a little longer than blacks. But when you compare that 75, 80 um, years of life to the 42, 48, it's a pretty profound difference. The 1994 sickle cell data is from a cohort that is um, frequently cited, and at the recent sickle cell meeting in Florida. In February this year, some data was presented that showed the very last set of bars where they compared data for life expectancy for sickle cell patients from 1997 to 2007 and see the identical median lifespan. This is a median lifespan. There are certainly many patients who live much longer than their 40s into their 50s, 60s, and some in their 70s. So that's a good thing, but the median life expectancy overall has not changed. Next slide. So to go into that a little bit more detail, they used the U.S. Uh, National Center for Health Statistics and compared 1979 to 1998 time period then to 99 to 2007 and did find really significant declines in the 0 to 4 age group, primarily due to the penicillin and to um, transfusion to prevent secondary, to prevent stroke. Smaller declines all the way up to age 19, but then that's really where it stopped. So in the adult group, there was no differences then from those time periods above. Certainly increase in the older age groups because patients were living longer. You can see the most frequent causes of death here. And these often start as pain episodes. Not always, but many times patients come in with a pain episode and it deteriorates into something else. Or something else is going on and we just haven't picked it up in the ED yet. I think these are important things to remember and to refocus when talking with ED providers. It just puts on a different 
pair of glasses for them to see these patients through. But it is a bigger picture and a bigger story than pain and opioids and narcotics. Next slide. But pain management is clearly the, the most common um, symptom, or pain is the most common symptom, and they seek pain management from us in the emergency department. And they do need um, high doses of opioids. Huh? And they need rapid aggressive pain okay. management to be able to decrease pain and to hopefully maximize the opportunity for these patients to be discharged home. We understand now that a lot of these patients also have chronic pain, but they still present with vasoclusive episodes. Next slide. <coughs> I'm going to switch a little bit now to the context in which we're trying to provide that care. So we're trying to provide rapid, aggressive pain management. The Institute of Medicine published this study on emergency care in 2006 and really illustrated how bad overcrowding, how bad of a problem overcrowding is in the United States. Between the loss of hospitals, loss of inpatient beds, population growth, the growth and the number of visits in emergency departments had, had increased in 2006 over 25%, which is a huge increase in volume. EDs are just slammed with patients every day. 91% of the, of the EDs reported overcrowding as a problem, and 40% on a daily basis. You know, 20, 30, 40, 50 patients wait in the emergency department in some places. Other places, they hold patients for waiting for inpatient beds for two, three, four days. Um, almost impossible in many states to find psychiatric facilities that will take psych patients, and those patients wait days as well. And what that, what that results in is delays to initial treatment and evaluation for all patients, but in particular for patients who have pain and all types of pain, because there is not a measure and it's not considered as life-threatening as, say, a heart attack or a stroke. Um, that is time-sensitive treatment that is available, and so it is they, those patients are prioritized. We can try to think of sickle cell pain as kind of body ischemia, that these patients are having ischemia as well, and really reframe it that way. And I think reframe it also with regards to other complications that may be happening that we may not know about. Next slide. Hey. High utilization is another um, concept that I want to introduce as a, as a um, barrier. And so when we think back to the case study we had, um, it, it illustrates some other work that's been done. We had a multi-center project where we had one patient with 195 visits Thank to you. one emergency department over two years. Um, it's also been found that some of these patients really just are sicker. They have more pain and more distress. Um, and then Dr. Broussard did a very nice, published a very nice paper in 2010 and looked at a really large sample of sickle cell patients across the country and found that about 17% had three or more ED visits or hospitalizations. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we know is that it's a very small proportion of persons with sickle cell have this high utilization. But from the ED provider perspective, those are the patients and that is the phase of sickle cell that they see every day, and that's the perception that we have to help correct. It's important to get these patients the right services. They're currently getting a lot of services. If you're in the department every two or three days, you're getting a lot of services. Are we really helping them? And as ED providers, the answer probably is no. Next slide. And finally, there's stigmatization that's out there that, you know, and I, we don't have to talk a lot about this, but it's clear that um, ED physicians and nurses both believe that there's a pretty decent proportion of patients with sickle cell that are addicted to opioids, and there's no data to back that up. And the last bullet point there shows what can happen with that, and this was the group of emergency of nurses, ED nurses, and they were really hesitant to administer high-dose opioids. So I think that, that we all know the attitudes and the stigmatization can re directly result in poor care. Next slide. And finally, the additional challenges for adults are that in some areas of the country, access to a physician that understands and can treat sickle cell can be very limited. Many practices are closing to, to Medicaid or to self-pay, so insurance can be limited. 
many clinicians, especially I, I think some AD nurses, we just don't learn that much about this disease and it is really, really complicated. And then that lack of education can lead to inadequate recognition of some other life-threatening complications. Next slide. <coughs> I'll be curious to hear um, comments on my model here. And so I think I put this all together as a model. I've used this for many years because I think that these are the different areas that we actually have to address individually and with different interventions to tackle the big problem and to tackle the big challenges that we have. Um, most of these we can try to tackle. Um, really cannot tackle, tackle racism, but we can tra tackle the other kind of barriers that we have here, but by different interventions. And I think you'll see some of that come through when we talk about um, the ED scans. Next slide. So back to the case study, when you look at this now, I think you see these barriers. We certainly see frequent visits in here. Um, we see that she is seeking high doses of medication. Next slide. And so what her diagnosis was was superior vena cava syndrome, which is a really critically a critical life-threatening complication. And she was treated appropriately and she was treated rapidly, um, but that, you know, um, she had a pretty dramatic presentation as well. Next slide. So we're going to move now to the ED scans. and. This is the goal of that project was to really to develop and and pilot test a measure or a decision support tool to be used by ED clinicians. And now that it's developed, the goal of this tool is really to assess and guide pain management in the ED and identify education and referral service delivery needs for adults with sickle cell. Next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, just the first two studies and not the last four studies to give you the idea of how this tool was actually developed. So the first was um, doing some field group, field experience, spending a lot of time in clinic and at expert centers around the country and then doing focus groups. Next slide. Um, so we did the clinic observation for a year and a half, did a bunch of focus groups, developed the tool, made some revisions, set it out to the expert panel around the country, got more feedback. And the aims for the focus groups were really to identify what should be on this tool. What should it look like? What should it include? Next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So we did a phys ED physician and nurse group at University of Colorado Denver. We did a patient group uh, in Illinois and in New Orleans. We did an ER physician and nurse group in Durham, North Carolina here at Duke, and another physician group out at Beth Israel in New York. Next slide. And the questions that we asked providers and patients were really what information is important to know about patients with sickle cell to be able to effectively care for them, identify analgesic treatment and referral needs, what would you do with this information, and what would make you use a tool like this, what would have to look like. And next slide. So you can see we did seven groups with 47 participants, pretty equal number of nurses, um, physicians, and then patients. We had 14 patients. Next slide. The major theme, three major themes arose from the focus groups, including things about acute management, things to think about with healthcare utilization, and then some characteristics of the tool itself, which I could comment on that now, that, you know, making it computer-based or web-based would be really great, and I think that's the next step. Some pieces of it could be embedded. Um, a decision tree or algorithm, standing orders incorporated it, and being concise. And you'll see it did not end up being concise. Um, I had a concise tool, and the experts actually said, that, you know, it can't be concise. So it really cannot be concise, um, but I think it's a good framework that people can work off of, even though it isn't actually considered concise. It's just too complicated of a, of a problem to be a concise tool. Next slide. So bottom line, um, the providers and the patients, this tool was really developed from them. Next slide. So then we created the tool um, and sent it out for expert review. Next slide. And seven key decisions really came up from this, and that is what do we need to do at triage? How do we need to manage pain? What, are, what should we do to do a good diagnostic evaluation for other complications? 
what can we do about the high-risk patient or high users? <coughs> What's the best practice for disposition, determining a disposition? For patients going home, do they need an analgesic prescription? And what other referrals do they need? And as you'll see when we go through the actual decisions, you'll see some are more nurse-focused, for example, triage. Some are more physician-focused, like the diagnostic evaluation. And some are both nurse and physician-focused. And the bottom line with this is that this is a, not a magic bullet, but it is a framework that emergency departments can use as a tool to guide quality improvement of care in a multidisciplinary setting. So they cannot make any headway at all just by themselves. They really, really need collaboration from key players, experts from around, from, from the hospital system. Next slide. So we're going to go through this in, in um, detail, but it came up with seven different decisions. Each one has a supporting algorithm that we'll go through and you'll be able to read better. Next slide. So it's a quality improvement framework and decision support tool. So it can be used with an individual patient, and then there's parts of it that are more useful for the department to work with the hospital. For example, the high-risk, high-user patient. Probably with an, an individual encounter with one patient who has you know, 192 visits, that nurse and that doctor aren't going to be able to do anything at that point in time. But working with a team to come up with a plan for that patient in the future, you would be able to do something. So it really is just a guide of the best way to identify how to give the best care to patients with sickle cell in the ED. It's a kind of measure called a commutometric measure, and I'm going to talk about this for a minute so you can understand outcomes with the tool. Psychometric measures we may be familiar with. So there are back, several depression measures, and all the questions are just asking questions so we can decide if someone is depressed or not. It is one construct. Quantometric measures are things that you may be familiar with, like the APGAR. So again, it's one construct, but we use it immediately, and we make treatment decisions from that. You know, if it's a bad APGAR score, we start some resuscitative measures on the infant. Next slide. The ED scans is a communometric measure, and what this really means is it measures multiple constructs, and in this, and in this case, it measures seven. So there's seven decisions, and then clinicians can immediately make decisions with it and plan service delivery. So plan how will I take care of their pain? What kind of, um, am I, am I going to admit them to the hospital or not? So it helps in decision making and planning care. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> and then the last study I'm going to talk about really briefly here is pilot testing. And so we, we tested this tool and we evaluated would clinicians use it the same way on cases and could they apply it to some paper cases correctly. And we actually um, did this with 10 ER nurses and physicians, taught them about the tool, did some paper cases, tested them, revised it, brought them back again, and tested them again. Next slide. So this is actually what they did. They did a, attended a two-hour workshop. I reviewed the scans, the ED scans. We designed um, three cases that then they could score how would they treat this patient for each of those seven decisions. So there was a total of 21 questions. We did them together, and then they did them by themselves, um, three test cases by themselves. We also measured face and utility validity. Does this make sense to the ED nurse or physician? And we made some modifications along the way to the decisions and to the cases. Next slide. So to measure face and utility validity, each clinician looked at each decision, each algorithm, and was asked to answer yes or no to these questions. Um, is the decision and the algorithm basically clear? Is it relevant to your practice or is it important? Is it easy to use and understand? And would it influence your patient management? Because these are the questions for that type of measure that need to be answered. If they don't make sense to the ER nurse and physician at the bedside, then it isn't going to be any help at all to anybody. Next slide. And so here are the results from that. And so what you can see in the first column is the decision. And then the next column is clarity. And so, you know, very good clarity between 90 to 100% or 80 to 100%. Um, 
you see the, the lowest scores for decision three when you go across, which was diagnostic evaluation. Um, physicians felt they had a very good handle on to diagnose and treat these patients. And uh, relevance overall was really high. Ease of use was very high. Influence practice was low, in between 56 and 80. Next slide. And the reason in talking with the providers at the time, um, and there was no difference between nurse and physician responses, was the lack of confidence in the systems to available to support the decision. So for example, decision seven may identify a patient that needs a social service referral. The particular department, apologize for that, um, the particular department did not have a social service, a social worker. So they really didn't think it was going to influence their practice because there was no one to refer those patients to. The same um, goes for admit to observation units. Uh, it only rings four times it should be done now. Sorry about that. Um, so if the, if the practice isn't that sickle cell patients can be admitted to an OBS unit to possibly avoid admission, it's not going to really affect their ability to change their practice. And that was really the reason that um, we feel that the scores were lower in that. And uh, next slide. And finally, this is the percent correct in agreement here. And so overall, what you see here is that Q1 through 7 reflect the different decisions. So Q1 is triage, 2 is pain management, 3 is diagnostic evaluation, 4 is the high-risk high user, 5 is admit or not, 6, do they need a prescription, and 7, what referrals. So percent correct is did they score the case? So the paper case scenario we gave them had all the information to apply the ED scans to a case. So they did a pretty good job overall, 85% correct. And the kappa is the agreement, did they score them the same? And overall it was 0.66, which is pretty moderate. Next slide. So I want to talk now about the actual ED scans. And these are the seven decisions. So let's go to the next slide and start to talk about pain management. Or triage, I'm sorry. And so triage, as you see, is primarily a nursing function, and this would um, pertain to people coming in from the waiting room and also really in the back if they come in by ambulance as well. And up at the top, what you can see pretty well is identification of something else that may be abnormal. So we have abnormal vital signs and um, chief complaints that should be red flags. And red flags is, a, is terminology that the ED providers used a lot during focus groups with me that these are things that they should really be suspicious of. And I can tell you without um, looking at this or being educated, there's no ED nurse out there that's going to be concerned about a temperature of 101. And you know, we like to see 105, 104. We like to see high blood pressures, you know, in 200. We see such high numbers all the time anyway that it sometimes takes a lot to impress an ED nurse. And that is because they don't have the education and knowledge to understand in this population how important this low threshold of abnormal vital signs really is. And so this piece can also be used as an education tool when implementing it, and it's really important. It's not that ED nurses are blowing off these vital signs. They just don't really know why they're so important or why these other complaints are really important. So what you'll see in the first diamond there is that if these, any of these um, things are present in the above box, then this is a very high priority. They should be placed very rapidly. We should notify the physician, and that's an important piece, because this is a patient who could have more going on and really needs the physician to be aware that they probably need a better diagnostic evaluation. This is not just treating their pain. Um, and sometimes as nurses, we can do a lot of care. I mean, you know, you may forget to notify the physician. We need to notify them really right away and then start pain management and then start that evaluation. If they don't have anything in that diamond, but they have pain 7 or 10 or greater, it's still a really high priority and they should be placed right away and we should start that pain management. And if their pain is less than 7, then they probably just, you know, have a laceration or sprain their ankle or something unrelated to their actual sickle cell disease. You'll see here intentionally there's no triage scores. Um, I do work and have done a lot of research on one of the triage systems that's probably the most popular in the United States now, and it's a five-level. Not all emergency departments use five-level systems, and so we really didn't want to confuse anybody by putting any kind of numbers in there. 
it's just whatever system they're using, um, the point on this algorithm is that if they have anything other than their typical vasoclusive pain, they are a really high priority and they should come back next. Uh, next slide. The second is analgesic management. And you see this is a nurse physician algorithm. And it starts with the gold standard at the top. So the best centers around the country work with hematologists or sickle cell providers, experts who have, who know these patients individually, who know what doses of medication they should get, how often they should get it. And so those are considered a gold standard of individualized plans. And so if the patient has an individualized plan and it's electronically available at your site, you should initiate it and that's the best care, and that's something to strive for in departments, a great place to do some quality improvement work. If the ED doesn't have that, and probably most don't, um, then at least do they have a protocol that is based on higher doses and more rapid redosing than what most of us would be able to tolerate walking in the door. We don't want to give them teeny weeny little doses of one or two or three milligrams of morphine. And if you do, then initiate that. If you don't, the very last at the bottom now is other things to consider. And so IV or sub-Q, because IM is, has such tissue damage and is so un unreliable that we really push sub-Q. And there's a lot of time that's wasted sometimes. So for patients who have difficult IV access, nurses don't necessarily think about, and nor do physicians, of just giving a sub-Q dose while you're waiting to get IV access. Um, in children, they use intranasal fentanyl. Um, it's possible that that could be a way even for adults. Um, but basically, PO isn't going to do it. They've already done that at home, um, but not to waste time. Definitely to avoid lower extremities um, for IV placement. And then if you're in this box, it means you don't have individual protocols. You don't have an ED department protocol, so it recommends some weight-based doses here. Um, considering PCA, and reassessing and readministering every 15 minutes, which is really important. Typically, patients get a dose, they wait an hour or so, and then get another dose, and that's really not rapid aggressive pain management, which is the goal. And very important in this box is titrating to pain and sedation. And so we want to give safe doses, and not all sickle cell patients require, need, or can tolerate high doses. And so it's really important to talk to that individual patient, and especially when they don't know the individual patient, you want to titrate to pain and sedation. And using the sedation is a good tool as well to be able to communicate with the patient. You know, if they're falling asleep, they want, you know, more Benadryl. You know, if they're too sleepy, we can explain to them, I can't give you more opioid because you're too sedate now from that Benadryl. I can't give you more Benadryl. So it's a, it's a nice way to deal with some of it. Sometimes in some settings, um, Benadryl becomes an issue. Uh, titering to pain. And then this is where it goes from the individual provider and patients to the department. And so if you're in this box, it means your setting doesn't have individualized protocols, which are the gold standard, and it doesn't even have a sickle cell protocol. And so this is where you need a quality improvement multidisciplinary team to start working on those um, and developing those individual-based plans is, is really good pain management. Next slide. The next slide is the one that is a little bit tricky, and the language was softened, and everything is consult and consider. And it's aimed to uh, raise some red flags and increase the level of suspicion when something more serious may be going on. And so the first dime in there indicates things that may require transfusion. And really encouraging the ER physician to consult with the sickle cell expert before transfusion because it is such a complicated um, scenario. Patients have such um, difficulty to have um, a lot of L immunizations, it's difficult to find blood for them. Um, they may not need it. They've had so much transfusion, so it's good to you know run that by another uh, by an expert in this area. And then uh, some indicators for sepsis and doing a septic workup, and it kind of goes from there. Uh, so again, it's a very um, overview, not specific, and it was more specific. 
but after expert review and actually when it was when I showed it to the EV providers, we really backed off on it and um, put everything down to consult because clearly there was not an evidence-based review for this. It's not how it was developed, and it's really not the intent of the tool. Next slide. Decision four is nurse physician, what to do with the high-risk severe disease or the high user. Um, and I am going to tweak this diamond a little bit. So patients who come in and say, I don't have a physician, and they have sickle cell disease are high-risk patients right there, and we're going to need some referrals. And so what you will see as we move on to decision seven, decision four and seven kind of work together. Patients who have had three or more painful episodes requiring hospitalization in a year are at an increased risk of death, and that makes them high risk of severe disease. And for EDs, we think, well, that's all of our patients with sickle cell. But when you actually look at your numbers, it's really not all your patients with sickle cell. It's the frequent visitors that are really challenging and high risk. Um, but that's why. Uh, difficulty getting appointments, so if you have patients who come in and they just can't make their appointment, that's a high-risk patient because they have a very complex disease. They need to be hooked into primary care or at least care with their sickle cell provider. They need both, um, but if they've got nobody, you know, they need to get hooked in. And then for, uh, for females who are pregnant, those are high-risk patients as well. And so if there's any yes there, this is, again, where that individual nurse and physician cannot solve this by themselves at that time. You, you can keep talking to these patients and say, you need to make your appointment. You need to get your appointment. That isn't going to do it on a one-time basis. You need a hospital-based QI team to really work on these challenges um, because they're, they're complex, and not every patient is the same. Every patient is a little unique and a little different. Um, we definitely want to provide referrals for all patients, and we want to work together multidisciplinary to solve this and to help identify and deliver what services these patients really need. Sometimes it's going to be referring to case management, and, you know, maybe on a rare occasion there is an ethics consult that might help um, pregnant patients to high-risk OB. Next slide. So moving along here pretty quickly, uh, disposition. What's unique about this is trying to avoid hospital admission unless it's really absolutely necessary. Um, there's, you know, talk among CMS to limit reimbursement for the same diagnosis within 30 days, and that's not here yet for this population, but I think hospitals anticipate it. So clearly if they need to be admitted for a medical or surgical reason, they just need to be admitted. If their pain has gotten better after multiple doses and they think they can go home, they need to go home, but they need to know when to come back how to treat their pain, and when to follow up with a primary care or sickle cell physician. If their pain, they've had three doses or, you know, been there a couple hours, it's getting better but not good enough yet to go home, what the algorithm is suggesting is transferring these patients to an observation or short-stay area for up to about 12 hours to get aggressive, continue aggressive pain management, which is modeled after the day hospital model where patients get rapid aggressive pain management, stay for four, six, maybe eight hours, and then usually go home. It could be that the patients who come to the ED are just sicker and they actually do need to be admitted, but nationally admission rates are between 30 and 50 percent, which is a far cry from, you know, the 10 to 15 percent that come from day hospitals. And I don't think we've had the model yet where we actually admit to observation, do really, really good pain control, and see if they can go home. Um, and so that's a, a health services outcome here that you can look at. And if their pain just isn't getting any better at all, then they need to be admitted. Um, but typically, because we're so overcrowded, sometimes we just tend to, you know, one, two, three, can you go or not? Can you stay, you know, make a decision here? You know, we don't do that with other populations. If you think about it from an ED perspective, we have abdominal pain patients in our department for six, eight hours, just working them up, trying to figure out what their abdominal pain is caused by. So it really isn't a good reason to kind of kick them out either. There's a good reason to put them in an observation or a short stay place. They can get fluids, they can get hydration, pain meds, and hopefully go home. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, and then the last is 
a little busy here, but it's referrals. And so on the left side is basically a physician or a sickle cell um, referral. Getting kind of working again with decision four. If they don't have, if they have a um, provider, if they have a physician referral, follow up within three to four days, or work with your own facility and see when they want to want them to be seen. Um, if the hospital, if the patient doesn't have a provider, does the hospital have a provider? And if they do, again, they should be referred there for follow up within whatever time period that provider wants. If the hospital doesn't have a provider, and this piece of the algorithm wasn't originally there, but was added when it went out to outside experts, because there are many places that don't have providers to refer them to. And this is really where you need to work with the hospital, because that's why those patients are in the ED. That's the only place they can get their care. And then the psychosocial service side on the other side, I'm going to do some modifications to this side of the algorithm. And it really, the top diamond identifies some patients who may have, um, may benefit from a behavioral health or a psych referral. And then the bottom is social service. And our experience in validating this with patients shows that about a third of patients with sickle cell have some social service needs. And so what is the best way to identify those patients and then hook them up so that they can get those services? If they're already in the system, then that's great. But if they're not, you know, it could be that they're homeless and they don't have any electricity or they don't have any heat and they're in, you know, in a cold state. Um, and the hospital tends to be a pretty warm place or a pretty cool place in the summer. Um, so there's a lot of reasons, I think, that for some individual patients could result in why they're there all the time. Next slide. And so our current project is actually funded by um, by ARC, and we're working with here at Duke with Winston, uh, Wake Forest Baptist in Winston-Salem, and we are evaluating the effect of implementing the triage, the pain management, the high risk, and the referral algorithms on improving patient outcomes, ED and hospital utilization, and then clinician attitudes by working with um, Dr. Haywood at Hopkins and his administering his provider attitudes towards patients with sickle cell survey. Next slide. And so some other future directions we have are going to be um, putting a website up by the end of the summer where the ED scans will be available for anybody to use. Hopefully get some training materials up there with some paper cases so that you can train providers and give them some background. <coughs> We're hoping ultimately to be able to start to work with the leadership of Emergency Nurse Association, American College of Emergency Physicians, Society of Academic Emergency Medicine, um, to talk about national dissemination strategies um, and, of course, identify some additional funding opportunities to further look at the effect of kind of using this algorithm to guide care with the hope of improving patient outcomes, process outcomes, and clinician outcomes by decreasing the frustration. And that is all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanabe. This was excellent. Really, really wonderful. We had a very large number of people um, watching us, so that's great. Okay. So um, we're now going to open the lines for questions. So if you have a question, you can um, ask it one of two ways. You can go to the Q&A tab and uh, type your question in there. Or if that um, ability, is, you, you don't have that ability right now, if you want to just come on the line and ask Dr. Tanabe. So you'll have to remember to push star six. And also we ask that you state your name and where you are calling from. But do we have any, we don't have any on the um, computer. Do we have any questions from anyone on the phone at this point? There's lots of people on the phone. No one has a question for Dr. Tanabe today? Yes, hello? Yes. Yes, hi. My name is Dr. Beverly. I'm calling from Kings County Hospital in New York City. And um, one of the challenges um, is this term drug seeker um, for patients, particularly the ones that are transitioned from adolescent to adult care in the age range between 18 and 25. And um, I just wondered whether or not you have any recommendations in terms of how to 
tamper down that language because it doesn't help and it just creates a lot more animosity and the care gets worse and it's become a vicious cycle. And so that's a great question and yep, drug seekers all the time. And in reality, they are seeking drugs, they're seeking pain medicine mm -hmm. to decrease their pain. Um, but I think it's just that broader issue of how negative the attitudes are and there is not a simple answer to just fix that attitude problem. I know I think knowledge of about the disease, more knowledge about how um, you know their their own situations, and I think dealing with the high user population because that really does color the attitudes for everybody because the drug seeking attitude is coming from the patient that you see every other day, and then that just becomes generalized to the other patients. And so an emergency department physician or nurse sees all, they may see all, an isolated ED physician or nurse may see all patients as drug seeking because what they see is the same. And there's probably about 10 or 15 patients in every ED, no matter who I talk to, that have this high utilization problem. It's this very, very, very small proportion of patients with sickle cell, but it's a very high proportion of the visits that they see. So I guess trying to see it from their side in that they see this person as drug seeking, these patients as drug seeking because they're seeing the same 10 patients all the time. And they don't remember the ones that they only see once a year or once every two years. Okay, but even if you refer them to the literature concerning the, the, the addiction uh, for sickle cell patients and patients with chronic pain disease or even in the general population, they have a lower addiction rate than any other group, but they get targeted the most. Oh, absolutely, and I totally agree with you. I, I couldn't agree more, but I don't think, and they can look at the literature and they can read the literature, but then they come back to work and they see the same person there every day or every other day. They see the same 10 people every day or every other day. And what I found interesting in working with our sickle cell team here, sometimes those are the patients that have already been kicked out of your practice. And so you don't see them anymore because you, on the provider side, the sickle cell and the hematology provider side, you don't have to see these patients anymore. You can kick them out. And there's very, very few patients I know that an individual sickle cell expert will kick out after a long time, but once you kick them out, we see them. Mm -hmm. And so now there's the challenge of, well, now what do we do? Because they do need a provider on the outside, and they are really, really challenging for you, and they're really, really challenging for us. But once you kick them out, you don't see them again, and we do. And that's what they remember. So even though they look at the data, what they see every day is those 10 patients that really have a challenge. And I don't think that they're addicted either, but I know, but we know they have psychosocial problems, they have neurocognitive problems, they're really sick. And, you know, it just depends on the individual person. So the ED really needs your help to figure out what to do with those challenging patients. And I think if you can help work on a plan for the challenging patients, then they're not going to see them every day and then maybe they'll start to see the other patients. And, you know, the other patients don't have those problems. And and I think that will help a lot. We're really starting to work very seriously now on case management with the high users. And that's a model that then the ER can use for other high users as well because they have other patients that are high users of the ET that are not sickle cell patients. So establishing... A case management model and a social service mo so you know social service con um, consult model for really challenging patients can help take that off the table because they're just frustrated. They don't really feel like they can help them. They they don't know what they need, and so all they can assume is that they're just addicted and looking for opioids. Thank you, Dr. Kanabi. So we have a few questions from um, people who have written in. The first is from Kathy Norcott with Piedmont Health Services and Sickle Cell Agency in Greensboro, North Carolina, and she says they are a community-based organization that provides education, counseling, testing, case management, and support services to persons living with sickle cell disease, and her question is, have you considered working with or making referrals to CBOs to assist with the psychosocial needs of sickle cell clients? And thank you for asking that question. <clears throat> and that is a great question, and I would love to do that. So please email me, 
and we would love to do that. I was very active in Illinois with the Sickle Cell Disease Association of Illinois, and um, actually at one point did have their brochures and were trying to put in a process where we could hand those out to patients. But I, I would love to do that, so please email me with your contact information. Wonderful. And um, if anybody on the phone would like to contact Dr. Tanabe and um, you don't have her contact information, if you'll email Shay um, Pope, S. Pope at cdc.gov, she can provide you with that. So our next question is from Janet Perry. Um, how are we to address psychosocial needs when seldom do public social workers understand the issues and hospitals are changing the role of hospital social workers to more of a discharging planning role, discharge planning role? Um, can I ask a question back then? So is, are you saying that there are no social workers in the department or they just don't understand the needs? Kind of both. Um, is Janet Perry on the phone? Yes. Can yeah. you hear okay, me? great. Um, we have social workers in the hospital, but their role is being changed toward discharge planning. So um, as we educate the social workers, their role is being changed to where um, they are limited in how much help they can actually give on the psychosocial side. The aim is to get the patient out as quickly as possible. Right, and so that's a really very real challenge in most in most places, I would think. Um, and you know, when I was developing this, I was really very frustrated and thinking, you know, all I'm going to do is identify a, a bunch of needs where services don't exist. Yeah. And so how is that even helpful? And I was very frustrated for a long time. And my mentor just kept telling me, he's like, you know, you can't fix it unless you really illuminate the needs, unless you really document what's out there. And I think one way to do it is dollars and readmission. And, you know, if you look at your readmissions for this population, you're going to identify a very small group of patients that have a lot of readmissions. And ultimately, with CMS not wanting to reimburse readmissions within 30 days for the same reason, um, they're going to want to deal with it. And I think it's education, but it's also data that you need to be able to look at your data and say, you know, here's our number of visits from this number of patients. And it really is pretty typical everywhere. Um, even in centers that have great teams, as we do here, we have 15 patients that have really, really high use, um, and we have great programs. So everywhere there's a small proportion of patients because they really have so many other kinds of needs. And we don't have a great understanding. We have a decent understanding, I think, sometimes. So I think looking at your numbers, I mean, our multi-center study, we had about 6,000 visits from, I think it was 300 patients. So, you know, it, it's just typical national data across the country, so your center's no different. And I think you just have to help educate them by starting with the data, with at least the visits and the readmissions, if not the dollars associated with it. Um, my rural site on the other project that I had had uh, the highest number of visits. They only had 31 patients, and they had about 900 ED visits. Wow. Over three years because they did not have a provider at all for the adults, mm. not a single person to see them. And so that's a little bit different than what you're saying, I realize. But what the data was able to do to drive the hospital to find and identify providers for them and also to start up kind of a day hospital area where sickle cell patients could go um, and it wasn't just for sickle cell patients, but they came up with sort of a multi-use area, which I'm hearing other places do as well um, for a model of care. So you have to show the need, and and then those roles can be revised. Our, our um, director of the social workers here is actually just revamping the, ED, or the sickle cell social worker's role to focus entirely on our 12 patients and then supplementing with some students to do some of the other kind of paperwork roles, like insurance paperwork and some other things that social workers do. So he can focus on um, really the case management for, for these 12 patients. Okay. So roles can be redesigned. Okay. Thank you. Sure, you're welcome. Thank you. So I think, we, although we have a couple of questions still waiting, I think we only have time for one more. Um, this is from P. Allen Jones. 
and it says, do you, did you see many EDs using NHLBI's Management of Sickle Cell Disease Treatment Guide? Even though it is 10 years old and needs updating, it is useful for educating these ED professionals. Um, there's a better one that is out there, and it's the American Pain Society Sickle Cell ED guidelines that you have to purchase. I think it's $10 from American Pain Society. But that was actually based off of the NHLBI Red Book that you're talking about. So it, it is helpful. Do I see many EDs using it? No. Um, I do know that, as I mentioned in the intro, that there's an expert panel and we're putting out um, evidence-based guidelines. And pain management will be in that. And I've written that section and it it is going to be more aggressive than what you see in the Red Book right now. Right now, the Red Book says cut the dose in half every 15 to 30 minutes, and the guidelines that we wrote are going to be more aggressive than that. They're not all approved yet, so I can't say what they're going to be, um, but I, I don't believe that the NHLBI or the APS guidelines are really sufficient in how to address pain. But I don't see many places using anything, so... Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we only have this line scheduled for an hour, so I am going to need um, to end this session. But again, for those of you who um, had your hand electronically raised or if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, you can send an email to Shay Pope, S-P-O-P-E at cdc.gov, and she can help put you in contact with Dr. Tanabe. So thank you again, Dr. Tanabe. Um, and I wanted to let everyone on the phone know our next webinar is going to take place on Thursday, June 28th. The topic is Sickle Cell Treat, What Every CBO Needs to Know, and our presenter will be Dr. Lynetta Jordan. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact Shay. And the, um, also so everyone knows, the, recording web, the recorded webinars are made available at scinfo.org. And if you go under the webinars toolbar, you'll see all of the um, webinars that have been in our series so far. So thank you, Dr. Tanabe, and thank you, everyone else, for participating. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye-bye.